we are talking about uh, transition today. I am going to uh, uh, stop sharing my screen, of course, and invite Deb uh, to start sharing hers and uh, share with us about the importance of transition. Welcome, Deb. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much for having me back. Um, it is a thrill to be with you today. And I am going to be talking about transition, obviously, and this is really my passion. This is what my dissertation research is on. Um, it's a very lengthy presentation. There's lots of slides and lots of pictures, really just to give you some ideas. Um, I feel like I've sat in many conferences and many meetings where there's just a lot of words on slides and I leave with wow, that's great information, but what do I do with it? Hopefully today you'll see what to do with it and um, maybe make changes in your practice or you know, just recognize how important transition is and how important it is for us to start early. So this was just the abstract. Um, again, why we're gonna talk about why it's important and how we can make start start making those changes now, even in elementary school. Um, so um, I think you had um, a chance to look over these when you registered as well. So I won't read all those. And you have all of these resources um, in the um, uploaded file to iEcho. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying all that right, but um, you have access to these handouts as well as other resources. So today we're talking about transition. And many of us think of the word change when we think about transition and change can be scary but change does not need to be stressful. Um, we, we're gonna talk a lot today about how we can really promote these transition skills from a very early age so that we can start minimizing the stress associated with it. And we'll also talk about how we can start building successes early so that we can build on those successes so transition is not so scary. We really want transition to be a journey that we're all on or that we all want to be on. Um, transition is a very complex process. It requires a lot of time. It requires self-discovery. It requires us to try on different hats, try on different occupations. I don't think I mentioned that I'm an occupational therapist. So we want them to try on different occupations. We want them to explore and we want them to develop prerequisite skills. And we can incorporate those things into our interventions. It is a continuum. It doesn't go from yellow to purple in one year or two years or four years. It takes a long time to get through that transition process. We all know that IDEA stipulates that we need to provide support supports for academic achievement, but we also need to develop skills in the area of post-secondary education, vocational skills, employment, and independent living skills or community living or functional living skills. So we can support students for other things outside of that academic realm, and we really should. Um, by federal law, but, um, transition must be addressed in the IEP by the age of 16. However, there are a lot of states that state that you must um, address it by the age of 14. And research shows that states that address it by 14 have better outcomes as far as post-secondary success. So I always ask, why aren't we addressing it even earlier? So we're going to dive into some of these outcomes and why it's so important that we talk about this topic. The outcomes are extremely poor for anyone with any type of disability. It could be blindness, it could be uh, orthopedic impairment, it could be autism, ID. Um, the Labor Department states that 83% of those adults with a disability are unemployed. And I always find that statistic so mind boggling to me. And for those going away to college, like for instance, somebody who quote unquote has high functioning autism that may even have a master's degree, um, they can have unemployment rates as high as 97%. Um, so there is also employment instability causing them to live in poverty. They develop a lot of secondary health issues, um, both physical and mental. 
um, high blood pressure, obesity, coronary artery disease, um, and then that can contribute to depression and anxiety. Um, many of them also have um, a high dependence upon their families and government assistance, and they have a lack of community involvement with a lack of routines. And we know most of our students and adults really do require um, routines in their life. So why do we have these outcomes? Some of it can be related to an intellectual disability, but it's really more related to not having social skills, not having work behaviors, not having self-determination skills, not having a match between their abilities and their interests, not having functional living skills, which includes functional communication skills. And all of these things can be addressed by related service providers. So what is our purpose in education? It's really to prepare all students for their future as an adult, which can include employment um, so that we are all contributing members of society. And when you hear about those employment rates, you have to think, are we really doing this? And it doesn't sound like the education system really is. So what are the predictors of success upon post-secondary transition? We said what the barriers were. Um, NTACT is a great website. It's the National, um, National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, NTACT, and they have a lot of great resources. But basically, if we address the barriers that I mentioned earlier, we can predict the future. So having social skills, having work behaviors, having self-determination skills, having functional living skills, having that match between our abilities and interests predicts success. But the biggest determining factor is that they should have paid work, volunteer work, or an internship by the age of 16. That is the biggest indicator of success upon graduation. So instead of addressing transition at 16 or possibly 14 for some states, at 16, the students need to be out of the building doing volunteer work, doing an internship. They should have all of these prerequisite skills established. They ha should have interests identified. They should know what their strengths are. They should have self-determination skills. So that's definitely not something that we are doing. <laughs> This graph is from Ohio Employment First, and they also have a lot of resources. Um, this shows several other predictors of success um, that are also on the NTACT website. Um, so you can see some of the ones we already talked about, social skills, functional living skills, work experiences, um, preparation, not just academically, but also vocationally and self-determination, but also having parental involvement, having appropriate expectations, having inclusion, having occupational exposure, and having collaborative networks are also all predictors. So how are we supporting all of these things as a related service provider or as a CIS? Um, how do we collaborate with the family? Do we involve them in anything other than IEP meetings? Do we collaborate with other team members and really share our knowledge? Um, are we developing self-determination skills? Do we promote inclusion and really adapt and modify the curriculum for the students using UDL principles so they can stay in gen ed as much as possible? Um, so how are we supporting these students in inclusive environments? This is actually a chart from Virginia um, that VDOE publishes. You can download it, you can print it off as a poster size. Um, but these are uh, 22 skills that Virginia employee employers, businesses have identified as essential skills for all employees to have. Uh, this includes those with disabilities. Um, so there are things like hygiene, problem solving, interacting with peers, interacting with supervisors, resolving a conflict, managing their time, um, being resourceful, taking initiative, working independently, following rules, listening to others, working as a team, having self-determination skills, being professional, using safety rules on the job. Um, so these are kind of those soft skills, kind of that hidden curriculum, if you will, that we can build into our sessions. 
when I've done work with transition, a lot of the teachers tell me, wow, it's really not the job I'm worried about. It's really everything else that comes along with the job. And they're absolutely right. Um, so we can build some of those things starting in elementary school. You know, we can build self-regulation or self-management skills early. We can talk about emotions. We can do activities related to emotions. And if you're tied to a handwriting goal, then write about emotions. Use that as your topic. What do you do when you're silly? How does it feel? Um, how can you change your zone if you're using zones of regulation? Um, and I know speech does a lot of stuff on um, emotions as well. Um, so working with speech, OT and speech together, looking at social skills and social participation, self-regulation, those types of things. So before we get into a lot of more particulars, I just want to share that when we do speak about um, businesses hiring um, employees with disabilities, there's a lot of positive research that states having someone with a disability on staff actually increases employee morale. Um, so that is a great way to try to sell this idea to a business. Uh, those with disabilities prefer doing routine tasks. It's very comforting for them. They do not want new tasks, new jobs, new responsibilities, and they don't get bored doing the same task. It's Again, it's very comforting. It's less stressful. It's very familiar. Um, they like to follow the rules. They have great attendance when we have a match between their interests and abilities. They're very motivated. Uh, they have high retention rates when, when uh, it, again, it is a job that matches uh, their abilities and interests. And then these are just evidence-based teaching strategies. Again, this is from Ohio Employment First, which a lot of us are doing this. It says teaching, but it could also be therapy interventions. And I use all of these within that second one at the top, community-based instruction. We're going to talk a lot about that today. But within that instructional strategy, I will build in social stories and visuals and video modeling and prompting and self-determination, all of the things that are on here I use within community-based instruction. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with Universal Design for Learning, um, but we'll have a lot of examples in here today um, to try to really promote inclusion um, for our students. So, you know, some students may engage with materials differently. They may be able to show their knowledge in a different way. Um, so really trying to figure out where their strengths are so they can show their knowledge. So I promised that we would be spending a lot of time talking about community-based instruction. So what is that? It is an evidence-based teaching strategy where students apply knowledge that they've learned in the classroom to a community setting. And a lot of times it's off campus. It is you know, going to the grocery store, going to a restaurant, um, going to a job site maybe, going to the mall. Um, but in elementary school and even in our middle school, what we have done is we have adopted our school as the community. And the reason we did that is because the students that um, I have been working with in this program um, don't really go out into the community with their families. Um, their families don't take them to the grocery store. They don't go to restaurants because of behaviors and so when we were taking them out, it was a very unfamiliar environment. And so uh, we were also getting a lot of behaviors and it really was just a lot of lost instruction and building very poor sensory memories for these students. Um, so instead of leaving campus, we decided let's stay on campus and adopt the school as our community. And the other thing is that leaving campus does not always promote a lot of consistency because you're maybe you're not always going to the same place off campus, whereas the school is a consent, a consistent place. Um, so there's a lot of very authentic learning and experiential learning that we do. Um, and CBI has uh, shown that it can improve post-school outcomes. So um, you're going to see a lot of examples today about CBI, um, and it also really needs to be done in a very low student-teacher ratio. Um, but all of a student's IEP goals can really be applied um, through CBI, and we will also um, be doing a lot of examples for that as well. 
Um, but this picture on here is actually from our farmer's market that we ran in our school. And a gen ed teacher posted um, on Facebook, I'm so happy this got pulled off. Great day and lots of learning using real jobs. Um, so again, just we'll have lots of examples um, throughout the presentation today. So these are some of um, the jobs that our students are doing in elementary school. Um, we have a garden. Uh, they may work in the garden. They sell ice cream in the um, cafeteria on the ice cream stand. They work in the library as a library helper. They work in the lost and found. They work on a coffee cart. They work in the farmer's market. Uh, they're using real money. Uh, they may match clock faces. So they're doing a lot of different types of math. Um, you know, maybe it's somebody who can't tell time, but they're taking that clock face and matching it to the other uh, another correct lock, uh, clock face. Um, maybe they are starting to associate that time with a specific job that they really like. Uh, maybe some are starting to tell time, but we pull in almost every academic goal um, into this CBI. So CBI can really promote all of those predictors of success uh, that we talked about earlier. There's a lot of natural consequences on a job. Um, so if you, um, you know, throw something in the hallway and it breaks and it, it hits something, then, you know, versus throwing it in the classroom, um, not saying that that has really ever happened, um, but there are natural consequences when you are, um, doing these school-based jobs. And it's much more difficult to have those natural consequences happen off campus um, in an unfamiliar setting. And you may have more behaviors in that off-campus setting. But CBI is really hands-on learning. And we know that many of our students learn best that way. They learn by doing. Um, and what as they're doing these jobs, they really start seeing what they like and what they don't like. Even in elementary school, they start building these preferences and these interests. Um, and that's exactly what we want. We can't wait to have them explore these things when they're 16, because we know at 16, they already know, need to know what they like and what their interests are. Um, so if they don't get to dabble in these occupations from an early from a very early age, they don't know what they can do. Um, you know, at 14 or 16, when we ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up or what do you want to do? We want them to have some realistic responses. Um, and they only can do that if they have these hands-on activities. So this is just a list of jobs that our students are doing in elementary school and middle school. They are rolled out by season. So when the students come to school in the fall, we don't have the coffee cart because it's in August. It's still too hot outside. We don't have coats in the lost and found because we don't, we're not wearing coats yet. We really come back to the garden um, and we kind of start from there. And then we don't really have that much in the garden in the winter, obviously. So the jobs are very seasonal. Um, which is really, really nice. And the way that um, I do this in the elementary school is that I co-lead a group twice a week in the autism classroom um, with the SLP. And we will introduce a job. We will use those um, teaching interventions that I talked about earlier. And um, we te teach them what the job is. We teach them the vocabulary of the job. We teach them how to greet the customer, whatever um, job it is. Um, we introduce it, and then once they we feel like they can do it, then the teacher and the assistant will actually implement the job in the school community. And I may follow up just to see how they're doing to make sure that we're creating um, independent skills, um, but they are actually implementing the jobs in the school community. And this is, I'm part of the AOTA Transition Community of Practice, and this is just another list. And again, you have all of these um, for other ideas. So some of the jobs our students are doing, again, is working in the library as a library helper. So they will go around and collect books, return the books, scan the books, and then place them on a cart for a parent volunteer to shelve. Um, we have banking job where they will count the money after farmer's market or coffee cart or lemonade stand. 
Um, in the cafeteria, they stock all the condiments, um, as well as juice bottles and water bottles. We've also made coffee mugs that will go on, we sell on the coffee cart. So many of the jobs also incorporate a lot of heavy work and provide a break from the academic classroom. So they almost provide um, a movement break instead of taking a lap around the hallway, it's doing a job and it's built into their schedule. All of our jobs um, include systematic instruction on how to perform the job. So I've made an interactive book for all of the jobs that teach the steps of the job. Um, so this is just an example of gardening, how to water the plants, um, how to plant the seeds, um, and we'll naturally bring in the water cycle, the plant cycle, parts of a plant. And the nice thing is that that will then segue into parts of our body and how to take care of our body and what does our body need. Um, so this was a, um, a lesson on how to pick carrots out of the garden. When working in the garden, we also pull in a lot of math. Um, so we'll sort potatoes and carrots. Uh, we also sort them by color. We usually plant four different color carrots. A lot of people didn't know that they came in four different colors. Um, we'll count them. You can see on that right-hand picture that there is a less than sign. So we will pull in concepts of less than, greater than. We will add, we will subtract. Um, we will sort money, we count money, we give change for money. Uh, we might measure the sunflowers to see how tall they are. We might do an estimate or a guesstimate on you know, how tall we think the sunflowers are. And then in that upper left-hand corner is a backpack delivery job that our students students do, um, and every backpack has a number on it. So for my students who are writing, um, I'll take a dry erase board and they have to write the number of the backpack, or maybe they have to trace it if that's what their goal is, or maybe they have to match it or whatever it is, um, that uh, backpack job has numbers on it. The lost and found, um, here are some of the task cards and closepin cards that we use for lost and found, um, all kinds of things to um, teach that job. Um, and we do have activity boxes or work task boxes like the mittens in the upper left-hand corner, um, but that's just to teach matching. Um, it's not the job. Working in the lost and found is the job. Um, but I love this because it brings in a lot of functional ways to do clothing fasteners. Um, so our students are very good at um, problem solving that and even turning shirts in or sleeves in. There's a lot of problem solving that goes into this job. And it's a huge help for the school. So it's a win-win. The cafeteria, we also have a lot of jobs in the cafeteria. We stock the condiments. We have visuals on the boxes, which you can see on the right-hand column or right-hand side. Um, I have student, one particular student that I had had him for five years. He had been in the building for five years. He had an AAC device. Um, I could show him on the AAC device that we were going to the cafeteria. He would not know where to go. I could say it with my words. He would not know where to go. But I showed him a picture of the cafeteria, and he knew exactly where to go. Um, so again, using that UDL and um, thinking about what they need in order to perform these jobs. Um, we also have a food recovery program, which is that upper left-hand corner, uh, where students who... Um, do not open packages. Instead of throwing them in the trash can, um, we save them. Our students will stock them in the uh, refrigerator. And then we have a volunteer organization, a homeless shelter that comes and picks up all this extra food. And it is amazing how much food it is. And Deb, uh, there's a question in the uh, chat about which school this is from. And uh, Sky, uh, this is, uh, Deb is from the opposite side of the country. Uh, yeah. So she's talking about things that are working in her area. Uh, so this is not I'm a out, school here. I'm outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia. If anyone has ever flown into Dulles Airport, I'm very close to Dulles Airport. Um, so yeah, every um, every school, even within my county, um, does this a little bit differently. So these are just kind of ideas, a brainstorm, um, think about other things that you can do. Um, the great thing about this food recovery program is that students in this autism classroom are really seen as contributors. Their strengths are seen. They are seen as independent. They are seen as a doer. Um, so 
that really creates a lot of pride and self-esteem in them um, and is a great model for, for other students in the building. Uh, for our farmer's market, um, we have obviously grown carrots and potatoes. Those are our two big vegetables that we've grown and sunflowers. Um, but in the winter, we've also grown herbs and have made vinegars and dressings from the herbs and then sold them. Um, we've made coffee mugs. Um, so you'll see some other ideas in here, but they decorate the bags. Um, they, you know, set it up. Um, so it, it's really amazing and it really brings the whole school together. We also may prepare chocolates for Valentine's Day, which is what you see on the right hand side. We've also done heart shaped Rice Krispie treats. And the whole time we're doing this, again, there's a lot of executive function. There's a lot of steps in the task. There's a lot of fine motor, but there's also a lot of soft skills that all of us as related service providers can address. And we talk about problem solving. We talk about team teamwork and helping each other out and those sorts of things and hygiene, washing our hands before we do these things, wearing gloves, as you can see in the picture. We also um, have assembled nursing bags for our school nurse. Um, and we have also assembled, we have SOLs, which are our state standardized um, state assessments in Virginia. Um, and uh, the students in the self-contained classrooms do not take those tests, but we prepare uh, good luck bags for them. And we assemble them. We have a left to right orientation. They sweep them in. Um, the SLP works on, um, you know, greeting their peers and wishing them good luck on their tests as we give them these bags. Um, so um, it, it's actually a really heartwarming experience to see the students hand these out and how grateful um, their peers are for getting them. We'll also do um, obviously a lot of language, um, especially since I work so closely with the SLP. Um, we will use some of these Ozobots and Bbots and use a lot of core word vocabulary, stop, go, turn, um, you know, all kinds of um, core words for our students, especially who are using AAC devices, but also because a lot of those core words are our sight words. Um, so we will incorporate um, these, this coding, if you will, into some of our activities. Um, and again, on that lower left-hand corner is just a very low tech file folder game. Um, which again, we would use in the classroom, but then we wanna see them apply some of these skills to the school community. I had mentioned that um, the jobs are built into their visual schedules and um, the students get to pick what job they would like to do that day. Um, and that gives us an idea of what their preferences are. It gives them some voice and choice and opportunities to make decisions. Um, it allows them to self-express their desires, their likes, and their interests. Um, and the QR codes are also up there. Uh, some of our students may have forgotten what the job is. So we have a QR code if they want to see what that job is. Um, again, this is the start of self-determination. Um, them letting us know what they like and setting, a, it's kind of a goal for that day, if you will. Anytime we have students go onto a, a job in the school community, they um, will use the supports that they have in the classroom. So if they use a timer in the classroom, we have that on the job. If they use headphones, then we have that on the job. If they have some type of reward chart, then we use that on the job. Um, the, the OT that works with the Department of Aging and Rehabilitation Services here in Virginia has identified that time management is really a key issue that she has for her adults um, on their job. Um, they leave for break, but they don't know when to come back or they don't know when to go for lunch and then they're like starving. Um, so starting young with some of these time timers, you're going to work on um, the job for 15 minutes or you're going to come back to the class in 15 minutes or whatever it is. And then slowly um, having them use maybe a wearable or use their phone as they get older so that it's more age appropriate or more socially appropriate. But this is why these skills take time. Um, and it's on a continuum, we have to start early. So in elementary school, we'll use a jobs journal. 
Um, some of it's very visual where they just kind of circle the answers. Some of them may actually write out a response. Some may type out their response. Again, UDL, depending upon the student's um, um, abilities, but we really want them to start thinking about the kinds of jobs that they like. Uh, and Deb, I, I, maybe you have said this already. I think most of our teams have a resource for uh, creating these kind of uh, visual supports. Can you tell me uh, what program it is that you use primarily, just for an FYI? Yeah, primarily I use lesson picks. Not all of these are lesson picks, like the this picture right here. Um, those, those are all board maker um, pictures, but uh, most of my things are lesson picks. Um, very easy to use, um, very user-friendly, easy to print out. Um, so that's primarily what I use. Thank uh, you. Uh -huh. And um, our students will advertise um, the different jobs that they're doing on the morning announcements. So they're very much a part of the school. Uh, they'll talk about the coffee cart or the farmer's market or composting. Um, and if they are somebody who is an AAC user, the AAC device is part of the commercial and, and part of the news show um, so that we're showing all abilities in a very inclusive way. So CBI can really develop a lot of those predictors of success, including functional living skills and self-determination skills. Um, it's really important that our students learn to make these really small decisions early before they have to make some large life decision. Uh, CBI is very inclusive. There can be a lot of peer involvement. We also have peer buddies. Um, the other great thing I mentioned earlier is that there's a lot of movement breaks as part of it. There's a lot of natural heavy work and strength addressed in the jobs. Uh, they're pushing, lifting, standing, walking, all with a purpose. The jobs usually only last about 15 minutes. Um, so it's really a natural break in the day. Um, and it's an authentic way for them to apply knowledge that they've learned. Um, so executive function, increasing independence, um, promoting expectations. Um, and then you can also build a lot of empathy um, from your gen ed peers. So we also want to talk about self-assessment and how they can let us know that they liked something or that they disliked something. Knowing they like a certain job by pushing that jelly bean switch is just as important as them letting us know that they did not like a certain job. We use the I Am Determined website, uh, which is from Virginia, um, for all of our students and their IEPs from preschool through high school. Uh, so they can start letting us know what they think their strengths, preferences, interests, and needs are. Um, and it can be done in a visual way with pictures uh, for our you know, um, students who have higher academic skills. Um, they can type out their responses. And then the other thing is that we have this vocational portfolio, which is in the upper right hand corner, um, and the students will start saying the jobs they like and the jobs they didn't like. Uh, and then that portfolio can go with them to middle school so that the middle school programs know what jobs they've done and what jobs that they have liked. This is a video of OT at Cedar Lane where um, I work and where most of these jobs were implemented. So this is in your handouts. You can scan it and watch it, uh, but I did want to include that. So as part of the copy cart, the students will stock the sweeteners um, on the caddy, on the cart, and also in the teacher's lounge. Uh, we have an interactive book about how to do the sweeteners. Um, we also do cut up activities cut up sentence activities related to these jobs. So this is an example for um, the sweeteners and then they have to find it on their AAC device or they have to write it or type it. Again, whatever their goals are, um, we incorporate this in. And we've also made a lot of digital books about the jobs, um, which is in the left-hand corner there. And the parents love this and they share the links with grandparents and aunts and cousins and all kinds of things. So we want to show accomplishments and we want to show success and it also gives parents ideas on things they can work on at home with their student or child. This shows a great continuum. It's specific for the copy cart, but all of these jobs have a continuum. We start in the classroom with the sweeteners on the upper left-hand corner. We go into the teacher's lounge and on the coffee cart to stock the sweeteners in elementary school. 
And then that upper middle picture is students ages 18 to 22 who are out doing work in a restaurant and stocking sweeteners on the restaurant tables. And then this last picture is our previous superintendent who is at one of our coffee shops in our high schools. A lot of our high schools have coffee shops and the students with special needs are working alongside students in the DECA program. And again, the idea is that they would take these skills learned in this coffee shop off campus into a restaurant or a coffee shop. So this is a great way that shows, a, shows you a continuum. Um, part of your handouts were goals and your goals were color coded according to these colors. Um, so you can just look at that handout, but it just gives you some ideas on goals that you can, that promote um, these transition skills in these different areas that were predictors of success. And these are just some more examples. Again, these are in your handout, but really almost any goal you can tie to CBI and implement on CBI. So you can look through these as well. I'm just going through these fast because I know you all can read and um, it's pretty self-explanatory. So functional living skills um, for OTs are really ADLs and IADLs. Um, so for those non-OTs, ADLs are really those skills that we need to do every day, uh, brushing our teeth, getting dressed, toileting, eating, and the like. IADLs or instrumental activities of daily living are those things that we may not do every day, but they support our daily needs. So grocery shopping, uh, meal prep, cleaning the house, being safe, using a communication device. Um, these steps all require, or, or these skills all require more executive function than our ADL skills. Um, and these are the IADL skills that AOTA has identified. But these are our functional living skills. Um, <clears throat> and all of our CBI jobs can be tied to one of these. So we work in the garden and we compost that's taking care of plants or the community. Um, we feed the birds that could be taking care of a pet or the community. Uh, work on the coffee cart can be simple meal prep. So all of these CBI jobs are tied to functional living skills. And we know that functional living skills can predict positive outcomes. Um, this is just another infographic. I love infographics. Um, and the, the other thing is you see communication on here, making and returning telephone calls, um, but it's also using an AAC device, taking care of the device, cleaning the device, charging the device, carrying the device. Are they carrying it correctly? Um, and if they have a hearing aid, can they change the batteries in the hearing aid? Do they have the fine motor skills to do that? Do they have the executive function to understand all the steps to do that? Do they know how to charge their power chair? All those things are functional living skills. There's a huge link between independence with functional living skills and employment. Um, and OTs especially are the experts on um, functional living skills, ADLs and IADLs. So students who are independent with these are more likely to be employed. And the thought is that if you have executive function skills to learn these tasks, then you can learn other tasks that also require executive function skills. But the other really big reason is that there's a direct link. If I can perform that IADL skill of making a sandwich, then I could work in a, in a sandwich shop. If I can feed a pet, I could work for a vet on a farm, for a pet sitting business, for a groomer. Um, so when we teach something that seems like so ordinary, we're really allowing our students to do something really extraordinary. So if they can make their bed, they could work in a hotel um, or a hospital. We can teach the functional living skills through that systematic instruction. Um, and we can 
teach these so that there is a balance for our students between academics and life skills. Um, CBI can also, um, again, help develop these functional living skills, can also promote social inclusion, career exploration, it can change expectations. Through these CBI jobs, a lot of their abilities are shown. Um, there's career exploration, so self-determination can develop. Um, these soft skills, these workplace behaviors, the social skills, the problem solving on the job, self-regulation, all of these are predictors and all of these can be addressed on the job. And it's not just for students who, you know, are considered, um, you know, low functioning or in programs or that sort of thing. It's really for all students, um, for students who are even going away to college. Um, some of them return home, not because of the academic rigor, but maybe because they did not know how to communicate with their roommates and resolve roommate conflicts. Maybe they didn't know how to take their medication. Maybe they didn't know how often they should do their laundry and they don't smell good. Um, so nobody wants to work with them. Their roommate doesn't want to live with them. Um, they're leaving because they can't figure out how to navigate the campus. Um, all of these things that really can be remedied before they go. So there are many benefits to work um, in performing occupations. It's really our reason and our purpose for being in public education. Um, ultimately, we want all students to be able to work. Uh, those that work are seen as contributors, have better self-esteem, are involved in a social community, are more independent, have self-determination skills, and have a better quality of life. And we really do want this for all students. Maybe they need assistive technology. Maybe they need other adaptations. Maybe they need AAC um, so they can access and participate and engage and explore. So... I know there's probably a ton of questions. I do have two case studies. I could not, I have so many students that I could talk about. Um, I did limit it to two, um, but seeing the case studies may answer some of your questions as well. So let's take a pause and it, it, such good information. And I, I love this because of, I, I put in the chat that in my past life, I worked with students at the community college level in, in job experiences. And so all of the, this is such great information that I hope we can all internalize and find a way to use some of these strategies. Does anybody have any questions before we talk about case study? And I do have, a, like I said, there's a lot of resources there um, that I uploaded. So some of the questions may be answered there as well. I know when I was asking students about what they wanted to do and, you know, all of the interest inventories, et cetera, I, one frequent one was, I want to work with computers. Okay, well, we know that's a pretty wide uh, job uh, description. So I would always start with, okay, are you telling me you would like to dust them? Okay, well, and so all, and then to lead to that, well, what else could you do with them? And so they may not be headed to be computer programmers, but I love what you're talking about and just opening minds to uh, what are all those peripheral jobs of yeah. working with horses? Right. That you, you don't have to be the one who writes them. Right. So. You don't have to be a jockey, but if we know that that's an interest, that really can help us steer them. And, you know, maybe they've self-determined that they want to work with horses, and we can start building that bridge and giving them ideas on what they could do with horses. Um, so many of my students are nonverbal um, so, you know, giving them ideas and giving them suggestions and letting them make some decisions based upon some of those ideas. Should we keep going? I love these case studies. Let's dive in. Okay. So this first little case study is um, a student that I had for many years. Um, I had him from the time he was two until the time he was in fourth grade, but I've kept in very close contact with the family and he is 16 now. Um, he was, when I saw him, he was in all gen ed. Um, he has spastic quad CP, very low vision. Um, he really could not 
read very well, if I wrote it really, really, really big, um, definitely cognitive impacts, but was very verbal, very, could talk to you in paragraphs, could tell you so many stories. Um, so obviously we had to adapt every activity for him to incorporate the motor, the vision, the cognition, um, the vision. So lots of UDL. So a lot of these pictures are just going to show you ways that we used UDL to promote him being in an inclusive classroom. Um, again, everything was adapted. I went to art with him. I went to APE with him. Um, I was in kindergarten language arts all the way through fourth grade. Um, so I think inclusion for both of these case studies were really key factors in their success. So this was in preschool. Um, again, he had the same expectations that the other kids did, um, but we may have adapted the activity for him. Uh, this was an art. Every art project, every art tool uh, was adapted for him so he could participate next to his typical peers. Um, he Again, he was seen in APE, and I would go in there as well. He was seen in music. Um, he played the... Um, um, recorder, but it was actually on an app um, as his fourth grade classroom did their assembly. He led them into their assembly. Um, I mentioned this quote earlier, and every time I hear of it, I think of this little guy. Um, but when we enable others to do the ordinary, we're really doing the extraordinary. Um, so working on independent feeding skills, drinking from a straw, toileting. Toileting was a huge obstacle for him. Um, but we did it. Um, and the doctors told the parents that he would never be toilet trained. And I completely disagreed with that. He was too bright for that to happen. And when mom wanted him to be so included, he needed to be toilet trained because nobody wants to sit next to somebody with a soiled diaper. Um, nor does anyone want to stand next to somebody on a job with a soiled diaper. So toileting is really important. It's an important life skill uh, that we need to address. And he was potty trained by fourth grade. So these are some more UDL activities that we did when we were working with spelling, reading, writing. He was obviously never going to be a writer because of his CP. Um, so all the different ways we adapted the curriculum so that he could um, read and um, write in his way. Um, he loved, um, we had adapted scissors for him. He loved them. So a lot of his art would be cut up paper. Um, and he would assemble them to make, um, this was a spider, um, but this was one of the ways he spelled was through magnetic letters. Um, this, all the rest of the class was working on the word you. Um, he was working on letter identification with that word, but matching the letters, identifying the letters, the letter sounds. Um, we had rubber stamps in the upper right-hand corner for numbers. And then we adapted all of his books with a piece of yarn and a binder clip as a page turner so that he could get books out of the library and the book not be ruined with popsicle sticks and sponges and the like. So again, just more, this was him in the musical production, um, leading his class in, um, they were doing a Cleopatra um, presentation. These are the adapted scissors, and these are other ways that we adapted the art curriculum for him. Again, you have access to this, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but more ideas, cut up sentences with tape, um, this is lesson picks, um, some of these um, spelling words with magnetic letters, putting Play-Doh balls on words. Um, he loved big trucks and big cars. So I found some big tractor tired um, lug nuts and we put those on PVC for him to spell words. Uh, we had him do QR codes. Um, he had a tabletop Promethean and he would drag and drop words for cut up sentences. So just lots of different ideas. This was a color coded um, keyboard that he had and um, working on typing using this enlarged keyboard. 
He worked on a lot of community navigation. Again, that is a life skill. Um, so learning his way around the school, making sure he didn't run into obstacles with his power wheelchair. And he had a job of delivering backpacks um, at the school. Um, although they didn't have backpacks at the school, but I still call it the backpack job. Um, but lots of people have jobs in the school. You know, we have school safety patrol, we have the flag raiser, we have the attendance kids. All kids need to have responsibilities and jobs in the school. So he also um, had a lot of adaptations at home. Um, I had met with a family and found out very quickly that dad was very handy. Um, so he would ask for ideas and then they would show us, send me pictures of what he did. They had very high expectations of him at home as well. Everyone had chores to do and he also had chores to do. Um, so we pulled those into his academics when they said, what did you do over the weekend um, for his weekend report? We would pull in those chores. So again, this is just more community navigation um, that we did with him. This is him navigating the school all by himself. Um, and in middle school, I did not have him in middle school because he moved, but I wanna show you some of the things I have done with some of my other middle schoolers um, for community navigation. Some of them, it's just showing them the picture. Um, we will also do package delivery in middle school. Um, or some of them, you can just put media center to gymnasium. Some of them just need the words they can read. Others need the visuals. Um, these are other ways that we did. This is also lesson picks. Um, so having him use post-it notes to spell words, to um, put sentences in order. And I have used this with some of my middle school students when they have been in facts class um, and they're baking cupcakes for their cupcake wars. Um, so again, more UDL strategies, flip books for letters and words. Um, this watch on the right hand side again I did not use for him it was before they really had that technology but I think it would have been great for him and I have a middle school student um, who that is this picture of um, again toileting is so important so she has an alarm on her watch she came to us in sixth grade not being potty trained and by seventh grade she was potty trained we told the parents about this wearable um, that it would alarm every hour um, and she gets up, she goes to the bathroom, she comes back on her own and she's potty trained. Um, and she's very capable um, of, she will have a job in the future. Um, so again, it's just so important. And this is just a milk jug handle uh, that I adapted um, so that we could work on um, a getting dressed activity on the tablet. Um, again, he did not have any type of um, grip really, every tool had to be adapted. So these are just more ideas that we adapted um, with his curriculum. Uh, this is a graphing, a gel graphing activity, um, making a 3D book. And chores are so important at home uh, because they do build expectations, they do build routines. And um, especially for someone who's using an AAC device, it's a lot of familiar words over and over and over again. So the parents start learning and being able to navigate the devices. Um, so he was um, very much a part of the family chores. And these are more, whatever the family was doing, he was doing, they adapted everything. He was an active participant. Um, he did all kinds of things in the community. Um, so again, very included. There were high expectations. Um, he would cut the grass, he would mulch, he would sand. Um, he delivered luggage. They had an Airbnb and he delivered the luggage um, to the guests. Um, so these are just more pictures of him sanding. His dad made the sanding table um, that had borders on it. Um, so that it helped keep his hands forward on the sanding table and also prevented the sander from falling off. So chores are the same as these functional living skills. If you can do some of these chores, then you can have a job. And I pose it to the parents like that. It's not just being able to take care of your house. It's that if you can take care of your house, you can apply that to a job. So I give all of my students chore, that's their homework over the summer, are chores. And He's in high school now, 
And he self-determined from all the experiences that he has been able to have that he wanted to have a coffee business. Well, actually, let me go back. He self-determined that he wanted to have a golf cart that his wheelchair could drive up onto. And his parents were like, well, that's awesome. We would love that to happen. But how are you going to pay for that? We can't pay for that. So he started brainstorming and he came up with the fact that he wanted a coffee business. And um, so he started it a year ago and he does custom coffees. He meets with the seller or the, I don't know what he calls it, the coffee maker to come up with his own flavors, his own, um, I guess, flavors. And um, he sells his coffee at a Sugar Plum Bakery, which is a bakery that hires adults with disabilities in Virginia Beach. Um, he's been on TV. He um, will make custom blends. So my daughter got married and we made a custom blend with my daughter's name and her husband's name. And this month, he got his custom golf cart um, with his um, the ramp that his wheelchair can ride onto. So he self-determined that. He set goals for himself. Yes, his family is definitely helping him. But if he did not have any of these expectations, he hadn't had any of these opportunities, this would have never happened. So I want to go on to the next case study because I know we're running out of time. And this one's also equally as um, exciting. Um, this is a student that I had who has Down syndrome. Um, I started working with her in kindergarten. And um, I'm still very close with the family. I worked with her in high school. Um, so just like with every other class, we start career exploration very early. Um, in preschool, we start doing firefighter. We start doing all of these things. And um, when she was in elementary school, she was in all gen ed. Um, and it was difficult. It needed to be modified as well. Um, but in fourth and fifth grade, she was starting to have a really difficult time being in some of the classes. The, the vocabulary, the speed, you all know, it was just hard. We had a program at the school for fourth and fifth grade helpers in the preschool. And so we asked her if she would like to be a helper in the preschool. Um, she was so happy. Um, so she got to run the Promethean for these preschoolers. She got to ask them questions. And in fourth grade, that's her writing that she self-determined, I would like to be a teacher. Um, and this is just one of the activities that we did with her about a scientist when she was in probably fourth grade. It's significantly adapted. So this is her. She also participated in after school activities. Um, she was very much included in the life of the school um, and, again, had high expectations. She was a school safety patrol. Um, she read to the kindergarten class when she was in fourth and fifth grade as a guest reader. Um, so it gave her a natural break in her day um, to get out of that classroom where the demands were so high. Um, and gave, gave her a little bit of a mental break, if you will, but also really boosted her self-esteem. So we kind of double dipped there um, with this. Uh, we did a lot of adaptations for her. We adapted the recorder. We color-coded the recorder, color-coded the notes. Um, this little xylophone up here is the app that I used with um, the previous case study when he entered the room for the, the recorder. Um, for middle school, we wanted her um, to select the musical instrument. So this was at middle school exploration night. Um, you know, what instrument do you want to take? Um, so she tried them out. Again, learning routines, learning the executive function of um, how to open it, how to close it, how to carry it, how to take care of it. Um, also, again, related to toileting, um, understanding how to change a pad and what to do with it and how to stay clean with it um, using these visuals, um, because again, it's, it's important. Nobody wants to be next to somebody who is soiled. So the other thing that's in middle school that's really, really important, especially here where we are, um, the students start taking career and technical education classes. Sometimes in some divisions, it's not till high school, but for us, it starts in middle school. Um, and these are all the career clusters um, that the students are exposed to. So we want to make sure that all of our students are taking those classes because they are predictor of success. The more classes they're in, 
um, like this, where there's career exploration, the more successful they will be upon graduation. So how are we adapting these classes so that students can access it? In middle school, I also run um, a group with the SLP, and we run it during a resource hour. By the time she got to middle school, she was starting to um, have kind of a hybrid. She had some gen ed um, classes, but she was also um, in some of the self-contained classes. Um, so she was in one of our groups that the SLP and I ran. And every month we do a mock shop. Um, it's a theme for the month. Um, but part of it is running a shop. And this one knows the popcorn shop. So she was part of this. And we always ask our students, if you like making popcorn, if you like making whatever it is we're doing that month, where could you work? We're always tying it to the future um, and what she could do. I could work at a movie theater. I could work at a, um, a football stadium. Um, I could work in a grocery store, um, those sorts of things. So building that connection for them. And that um, QR code that you have is a digital book that we made um, that we were able to send home to the parents. And um, it talked about what we did on the popcorn shop. So it was a digital digital story. And some of our students, depending upon um, their abilities, are typing some of those as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't talk about that. Um, in music class, in middle school, after she went through, she decided to do chorus instead of the guitar after she had the middle school exploration night, she did chorus. She was actually in several plays. She was an orphan and Annie um, in middle school. Um, and in eighth grade, she self-determined that she really wanted to be in marching band. And we talked with the marching band. He said, I'm on board with it, but I would prefer that she not have a marching part because it's too difficult to learn the instrument and the marching formation. So the percussion instruments do not march, they stand. So she did cymbals and triangles. Um, and I came up with Go Fish Games so that she could help um, learn some of her notes. Uh, we had this interactive clef. I made these on lesson picks as well. Uh, so that she could start learning her notes to read the music. I also supported her in um, her facts class, um, family and consumer science, old home ec class. Um, this is not her project, this football, but it was a student of mine that I was talking with Deborah about earlier who wanted to be an NFL football player. He had an intellectual disability and had very, very low vision. Um, so we took those interests of his and we talked about all the things he could do um, with an NFL player. And this was the football he made in sewing class. So it wasn't really about sewing as the job and as a career, but what you made with that um, sewing activity. So he self-determined he wanted to make a football. He was very proud of that football. He did it by himself. Um, so we adapted a lot of things for him um, because of the fact that he had low vision. Uh, I can't remember what she made, but um, I'm sure it was something equally as heartwarming. Um, facts class also has a lot of cooking. So we changed a lot of her recipes into visual recipes. She was a reader, um, but it just makes it a lot easier um, when you're in this busy class full of gen ed students to have this adapted recipe. Um, so we did that. We adapted for CTE classes um, for tech ed. Um, so they do an automotive class. They do 3D modeling. They do architecture. We adapted all of that for her so that she could access it. In high school, she self-determined that she wanted to come back to her elementary school and she wanted to work in the preschool classroom. So the mom and I talked, I talked with the principal, talked with quite a few other um, people, and everyone was on board with it. Everybody wanted her to come back. Um, so we were getting her ready for that internship, paid work experience, or volunteer work in high school. Um, and this is her on the right with the preschoolers. Um, very, very happy. So she came back um, and worked in the preschool um, for one whole year. She only came in one day a week and it was only for like two or three hours. Um, she didn't really have the stamina or the endurance to do more than that. 
So we really had her, um, she got involved in Special Olympics. They have a unified sports program. She started taking advanced PE with the football players who loved her um, to try to really boost her stamina and endurance. Um, she started coming more often on her internship. She went from the preschool classroom to the kindergarten classroom, which was larger. She had more responsibilities. Again, she started staying longer. And then she self-determined that she wants, so these are more heavy work ideas that we did with her at the high school uh, to help build her endurance during the day. But then she self-determined that she wanted to work in the cafeteria. Um, so... Uh, we met with a cafeteria manager. He was on board with it. Um, she was delivering breakfast meals in the morning. I made visuals for her. Um, she was packaging items, very independent. And then COVID hit and her whole job changed. Um, the way we did things, the social distancing, everything had to be changed. So I met with the manager again. He came up with all new um job duties, job tasks, the way of doing it. And I sent it all home with her. I made all kinds of things on lesson picks, which you can see on here, um, how to package the um, um, lunch, how to package the breakfast, um, what we need to leave at home, what we need to wear at home, at, wear at school, um, on the job. And by the time she came back, I made a PowerPoint with audio so it could be read to her. Um, by the time she came back, she was completely independent um, with the job in the cafeteria. She also served as um, a poster uh, model for proper lifting. And she was on the morning announcements at her high school before she came into um, her internship. She was elected homecoming queen. Everybody at high school knows her. Um, very integrated, very included, very supported. And happy to say that now she is a lunch lady. Um, she is a hired lunch lady in the school cafeteria that she went to elementary school in. And she is so proud of herself. She is my peer. Um, she doesn't have to call me Mrs. Schwind anymore. She calls me Debbie. Um, you know, she is my peer. Um, and I think this is really our, our whole why. It's our whole purpose in education is to see this. It's not always about handwriting. Um, and so um, she's a really fun kid. This is a, if you've never seen this video, I would really highly encourage you to watch this. It's called The Hiring Chain. Sting um, sings it. And um, I sent this video to our principal after he hired her. And, you know, just said, because of what you did, you could really change things for other people. Uh, but it's a great video. Um, so, you know, take a peek at that. So we're just going to wrap it up here. Um, you really just need to start early. Um, the foundation needs to start early. We can develop these social skills, career interests, functional living skills, um, self-determination skills really, really early. Um, so that our students can be successful when they leave. Um, and we really cannot start at 14 or 16. At 16, they really need to be out in the community doing that internship, volunteer work, um, or paid employment. And then just remember our why. Why are we here? Um, these are students of mine um, that wrote these um, or made these sentences after working in the elementary school. So we asked all of our other students what they want to do when they grow up. Um, students with special needs are no different. They need to, to let us know what they want to do as well. And that comes with opportunities to try on these different expectations. Um, I think sometimes it's really easy to see limitations, um, but we as professionals are so good at seeing the possibilities. Um, so we can really share that with our families. And then I just leave you with this. Our education is a dress rehearsal for a life that is yours to lead. Um, but are we allowing that dress rehearsal for our students um, with disabilities? Um, so just food for thought. Thank you so much. Um, I have so much that I could share. Um, it's, 
I know so many of us get tied to, um, you know, handwriting goals, but I still pull this in um, to my students that I'm working on handwriting with. If it's, you know, whatever project it is that they're working in the class when I push in, um, it's so important that these skills are developed and we can do it in a backdoor way. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, today we're doing the lesson on social skills. Um, it can be done in a backdoor way through other goals and interventions that we're doing. So if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer them. Wendy, I see that you have your hand up. Please feel free Hello. to unmute. Hi. So first, I have to say, this is great to um, see. I'm actually a school PT. And so, I mean, I know this was definitely more um, OT focused, but even just like some of your goal examples and things that you're showing, like and really that, seeing even as a PT, how I can be involved. But just kind of more curious, um, knowing in our school system where, you know, I feel like sometimes we're just, you know, time, <laughs> you know, having time to build programs like this. So just curious about, how you really got it implemented and like buy-in from the teachers. And then just even curious how you as a team, like do you guys get together and meet and kind of like pick pilot students or pilot schools or just to really make it something possible with out immediately trying to do this on every single student and every single school? Yeah, I mean, you definitely cannot do that. This has taken many, many years to develop. Um, I think the very first thing that you have to do is you have to have a supportive principal. And, and without that, if it is a principal that does not believe in inclusion, that does not think that all students need to be involved and you don't really need to have a community of students, it will never work. Um, so that's really almost the very first thing that you need is a very supportive administration within the building. Um, and the way that I worked it was um, because these were students in a program, not the case studies, but a lot of the pictures earlier and the background knowledge were from our program students. Um, I naturally was kind of seeing them in a group anyway. Um, and um, so it just naturally unfolded almost. I was, I went out on CBI with them for almost a whole year and it was horrible. It was so embarrassing and it was so heart-wrenching because the students had never been to a grocery store. They had never been to McDonald's. They had never been to a pet store and the behaviors were just so extreme because it was an unfamiliar environment. They didn't know what to expect. Even though we would show them pictures, we're going here. Um, it's, you know, the noises, the sights, the sounds, the bus ride. Some of them thought they were getting on the bus to go home. And when they weren't at home and we were at the store, it was a total meltdown. Um, and after a year, I just went to the teacher and I was like, I just, I can't do this. Like I have so many things in my schedule. I just really, I love you and I love the kids, but I'm just going to have to do my own group with them separate. I can't support the CBI because what would happen is they would come back and the rest of the day was just lost um, because they were trying to de-escalate. They were still escalated. They were sleeping. Um, so that's how a lot of this kind of started was what can we do differently so that this can be a really good learning experience um, and I can support you. Um, and we started with the coffee cart. Um, that's all we had to start with. And then it just started blossoming and blooming and growing. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of materials um, to start one of these programs, you know, all the interactive books and the supplies and those sorts of things. But if you just say, you know, every year I'm going to do two new ones, um, then it's a lot more manageable. And then you can take that information and apply it to a new school, which is what I would do, is I have another school that has a garden. So I said, how about we do a farmer's market? And the principal was all over it. Um, so it kind of blooms like that and other schools start hearing about it. Other principals start hearing about it. And then that also helps with the, the marketing of it. 